Hi guys, my name is Sarvan Kumar. I'm your economic faculty. Welcome to Rathod's IAS Economic Weekly Series. As usual, even this week, we do have a lot of economic current affairs which appeared in the different newspapers. So without wasting any time, let us look at the first topic. See, the first topic that we are going to discuss today is the foreign portfolio investors market exit. Right? Foreign portfolio investors have pulled out the rupees 42,000 crores this month amid raising inflation and monetary policy tightening in the US. So in this context, first we need to know the difference between the foreign direct investments and foreign portfolio investments. In order to understand the foreign direct investments and foreign portfolio investments, first we should be aware of what is a primary market and what is a secondary market. These two are the compositions of the capital market. Right? Before we understand about the foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment, we should be aware about the capital market. And the capital market is composed with the primary market and secondary market. Now, what is this market is all about? And what is the difference between this capital market and primary market? We have clearly discussed these things in our static classes. But as I promised for the rest of the students, as I am going to give you a brief basics also in the current affairs classes. So first we are going to have some basic concepts and first we will get a clarity and then we will move into the current affairs. See, first of all you need to understand the definition between, the difference between the money market, the money market as well as capital market. The money market and capital market. Let's try to understand a money market is a market which is meant for providing the loans or I would put it in such a way. Money market is a market where the borrowing and lending activities takes for the borrowing and lending activities takes for short term period. It takes for short term period. Right? Next, the capital market is that kind of a market where the borrowing and lending activities takes for long term period. It is going to happen for the long term period. So, this is the first thing you need to keep in your mind. A money market is a market where the borrowing and lending activities takes for a short term period. Say for example, this than 3 years. A capital market is a market where the borrowing and lending activities takes for the long term period. Say that is more than 3 years. Say for example, if I want a loan, if I want a long term loan, then I would go to the capital market. If just I want a short term loan, then I would go for the money market. So if the borrowing, so on the basis of this borrowing and lending activities and their respective time periods, we divide the markets into two, money market and capital market. So now we are going to discuss about this capital market in a brief. See, as I said, the capital market is composed of this primary market, the primary market and secondary market. And now with a simple example, we are going to understand how this primary market and secondary market works in an economy. See guys, try to understand. Now imagine this is a company. Imagine this is a company and he is the owner of that particular company. He is the owner of that particular company and imagine there are a multiple owners of this particular company. There are multiple owners of this particular company. Now try to understand, imagine this guy, these five guys are the owners of that particular company. Now in order to establish this particular company, they have invested an amount of 1000 rupees. They have invested an amount of 1000 rupees and they have divided this 1000 rupees into 1000 shares. They have divided this 1000 rupees into 1000 shares. So automatically one share here is equal to 1 rupee. One share here is equal to 1 rupee. Right. See guys, now see if these guys want to sell their share to the public for the first time. Imagine these guys, this company, this company have sold about 300 shares, 300 shares out of this 1000 shares to the public for the first time, for the first time. The name itself is suggesting 
it is called initial public offering we call it as initial public offering if the company sells its shares for the first time to the public it is called initial public offering initial means for the first time to the public means like people you and me offering means offering their shares right this is called initial public offering right i hope it is very clear now the company is left with the company is left with 700 shares here now understand if this company is running good the owners thought that they would expand the branch of this particular company to the other state for that they required additional money imagine they required 300 rupees extra so now this company again see this company again went for issuing 300 or say for example 400 new shares 400 new shares to the public we call it as we call it as follow on public offering see initial this following the initial public offering initially this company was established with 1000 rupees and each share is worth of 1 rupee now out of this the 300 shares were given to the public for the first time they want to this one this company wants to sell their shares to the public for the first time in order to get the money then we call it as initial public offering and in order to expand the branches of this particular company if the company again goes for selling their shares then we call it as follow on public offering initial public offering we call it as initial public offering right i hope you are getting it initial public offering and follow on public offering follow on public offering right now try to understand see now so if they are left with the 700 shares now they added 400 shares now totally the company have 1100 shares and with the public they already have 300 shares right this is what currently the company have now imagine currently the owners have see currently the owners have 700 shares with them isn't it now our sebi says that at least this company should hold 25 percentage of their shares with the public this is minimum reserve system that a company need to be maintained with the public this is the guidelines given by the sebi which means any com company any top company according to the market capitalization any top 200 companies according to the market capitalization need to maintain at least 25 percentage of the shares with the public 25 percentage of the ownership with the public now what is the meaning of top 200 companies according to market capitalization simple guys imagine this is company and this company issued a 10 shares imagine this company has issued 10 shares and each shares price is 10 rupees so automatically the market capitalization of this particular company is 100 rupees simply market capitalization means if you multiply the number of shares issued by a company number of bonds issued by a company multiplied by their prices then you will get the market capitalization so in such a way according to the market capitalization top 200 companies need to maintain at least 25 percentage of their ownership with the public 25 percentage of the share with the public we call it as minimum reserve system minimum reserve to be maintained with the public now when these norms came around 2013 many of these owners in such a way wants to sell off their shares to the public as they need to follow the SEBI norms now as a result see imagine imagine there are five guys here imagine out of this this five guys having 700 shares now one of the guy see one of the guy is holding 200 shares one of the guys holding 200 shares now they want to sell see this guy is holding 200 shares this guy is holding 200 shares and the rest of the people is holding the rest of the 100 100 and 100 so cumulatively they are holding 700 rupees of shares now understand imagine the company wants to sell at least the company want to sell at least 250 shares to the public so that they comes to be they deem it to be maintaining 25 percent with the public you getting my point if the company holders if this owners sells at least 250 shares to the public then only their 25 percent norms as prescribed by the sebi will be fulfilled now say for example this guy wants to sell is 100 shares out of 200 this guy also want to sell this 100 shares out of 200 now this third guy this guy have decided to sell 50 out of his shares so totally they sold 250 shares to the public now this is called offer for sale 
you might have a doubt that what is the difference between follow on public offering and offer for sale if the two these two things goes in a similar way see the company is established with a thousand and for the first time they have issued a shares which is 300 so it is called initial public offering initial public offering now the company want to expand so they want additional amount so they issued a new shares again which is 400 we call it as follow on public offering in both the initial public offering the money 300 they show they sold 300 300 shares so each shares price is 1 rupee so they will get the 300 rupees the company will get the 300 rupees and it is deposited into the account of the company in the second case also in the follow on public offering the money again get deposited into the company account both in the initial public offering, the follow on public offering, see they sold 400 shares. So both the 300 rupees deposited in the account of the company, the 400 shares, this 400 shares is also deposited into the account of the company. But this 250 shares, see out of this 250 rupees, these guy get, get the 100 and these guy sold 100 out of his and this 50 will be given to him. So, in the offer for sale, the amount, the collected amount of 250 rupees will be given or shared with the account or taken into the pockets of the shareholders. So, I hope you clearly understood initial public offering, follow on public offering and offer for sale. Right. Now, let us continue the discussion. Now, having understood that, imagine, imagine. Let us try to understand the same company has issued out of the C in the initial public offering the company has issued 300 shares. Now let us consider this is guy, this guy and this guy have purchased about 50 shares in it. This guy have purchased 50 shares in it. So try to understand two important terms here. Subscribe and see means subscribe means purchasing. In the capital market terms subscribing means purchasing issue means issue means selling this company has issued 300 shares out of these 300 shares issue means sell sold 300 shares out of these 300 shares this particular guy have subscribed means purchased about 50 shares i hope it is very clear now this guy hold 50 shares over a particular period of time and after a period of time he wants money urgently and then he wants to sell off this particular share so that he will get 50 rupees initially he used 50 rupees of the money to purchase the shares now he wants to sell it off now where can he sell off sell it off there is a market there is a secondary market called bombay stock exchanges and national stock exchange once the company issues the shares for the first time in the initial public offering this company will get listed in the bombay stock exchange or national stock exchange or any other stock exchanges so that this person after a period of time can sell his purchased shares in the secondary market it is similar to your OLX market like you purchase your mobile you use it and after a period of time if you want to sell it you can sell it in the OLX similarly he purchased see we have we call it as a first hand mobile and then we call it as a second hand mobile later see initially this guy have purchased three, 50 shares out of the 300 issued by this company he hold it for a particular period of time now he wants to sell it off so we have this bombay stock where he can sell it we have the bombay stock exchange and we have the national stock exchange so that's the reason why we call it as a secondary market why we call it as a secondary market now i hope you clearly understood what is the meaning of a primary market what is the meaning of the secondary market we call it as a second the name itself suggesting it's a secondary market second hand market for the shares and bonds right? i hope it is very clear so this is the initial public offering the follow on public offering the offer for sale where the new shares the remember this word new the new shares are issued to the public are called the primary market this is called primary market where already issues issued shares are sold and right trading is happening this is called secondary market name itself is suggesting it's a second hand market this is a first hand market primary market so this is the composition of capital market in the capital market we have the primary market and we have the secondary market and how the primary market works and how the secondary market works this is how the primary and secondary market works in a economy right as i said in order to understand the foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investments 
foreign direct investments and foreign portfolio investment you should be aware of the capital market now you also aware about the capital market composition capital market is a market for the long term borrowings like right? in these markets you can issue a bond which is a, which have a maturity of 20 years it's a long term period so capital market is a market where the borrowing and lending activity takes for a long term period when contrast to the money market it is short term period so thus the definition is very clear the next thing you have to study is the composition of the capital market the capital market is composed of both the primary market and secondary market now comes the definition of fda now i hope you it is very clear you have understood the definitions of fda and fpa very clearly now all those investments coming into the country see here it is very common guys foreign is common anyway the investments is coming into india from the foreign country you need to understand the difference between the direct investment and portfolio investment what is the difference between them if the in foreign investments come to india through the primary market through the primary market usually through the primary market then we call it as foreign direct investment and if the portfolio if the investments come to into india through the secondary market then it is called foreign portfolio investment now understand take the same example imagine out of these 300 shares this guy have subscribed purchased it to 50 shares what does it mean this guy have given 50 rupees to this particular company and now imagine this guy have sold his 50 shares this guy have sold his 50 shares in the bombay stock exchange this guy sold his 50 shares in the bombay stock exchange now imagine he is a foreigner he is a foreigner and he have purchased that 50 rupees 50 shares 50 rupees worth of the shares so what does it mean if this foreigner purchases this 50 rupees worth of the shares this guy this one this particular guy is going to get his 50 rupees he is going to get his 50 rupees automatically then see he is going to get this 50 rupees then you can understand itself that this particular guy after paying this 50 rupees to this particular person automatically this guy get eliminated and he would be the person who hold 50 shares in this particular company don't you think it is an investment so in such a way the investments comes into india through the secondary market right even this minus as he, this guy have paid this 50 rupees to the original one then automatically he, this would be the person who is holding that 50 shares in this particular company now this is called portfolio investment if the investment comes into india through the secondary markets it is called portfolio investment if the india if the investment comes into india through the primary market say for example in the initial public offering see say for example this company has issued 300 shares out of this 50 shares is being subscribed by this particular person and remaining say for example out of this remaining 250 again 50 shares is being subscribed by a particular person purchased by a particular person who is located in the foreign country then it is called foreign direct investment if the company issues shares for the first time new shares in the initial public offering and for one public offering or in offer for sale and if the foreigners purchases or subscribe to that particular shares right what is the meaning of subscribing if my company it is the my it is come it is my company imagine it's my company and i have issued a shares 300 worth of shares now automatically if i am issuing 300 worth of the shares means those people who subscribe to that shares will take my shares and they are going to give the money for me so now out of this 300 50 is being subscribed by domestic person and another 50 is subscribed by purchased by you know the meaning of subscribing just now i told you this is the meaning of purchasing it is being purchased by the foreigner so if he purchases 50 shares out of my company he is going to give me 50 rupees so automatically he is giving me an investment of 50 so we call it as foreign direct investment the investment coming from the foreign country it is directly getting invested in through the primary market in my company so it is called foreign direct investment now if the same investment come through the secondary market say for example this domestic guy sold it in the this domestic guy who who hold who purchased initially the 50 shares have sold it in the secondary market then those shares are being purchased by some foreigner then we call it as foreign portfolio investment in such a way to the economy foreign direct, direct investments come to through the primary market and through the secondary market the if the investment comes into india we call it as portfolio investment right i hope it is very clear for you usually a foreign direct investment or a foreign person invests in india through the foreign direct investment so that he can have some ownership of the particular company and he can also control the production process but whereas in the portfolio investment he just purchases the shares he holds it for a particular period of time and then he sells it off he is just a pure business right it's like trading 
you purchase the shares you purchase the bonds of a particular company hold it for a particular period of time and you can sell it again in the secondary market itself once it is sold in the secondary market it again gets sold in the secondary market this goes on and revolves in the same way so if the investments all those investments coming into the country other than the secondary market is called foreign direct investment and all those investments coming into the country through the secondary markets is called foreign portfolio investments and in our static classes we have discussed that foreign portfolio investments are of usually three types what are they they are the depository receipts foreign institutional investors and offshore funds we have clearly discussed about these things in our previous classes also and also clearly in our static classes so this is the basic difference between foreign direct investments and foreign portfolio investments so in this topic you have claimed to understand right you know you have come to understood about the meaning of the capital market you also understood the composition of the capital market that is the primary market and secondary market and you also understood the mechanism of shares and bonds how this trading happens in this particular thing and you also clearly understood the difference between fdis and fps so the basics are clear for you right now now then you can understand this current affairs as i said the difference what is the meaning of foreign direct investment see all those investments made into the country other than through the secondary market other than the secondary market what is the market we have the primary market so all those investments coming into the country through the primary market and the tools in the primary market are nothing but ipos initial public offering follow on public offering and offer for sale so we call it as a direct investment see direct control over the assets and say over the affairs of the company any person who want to invest in the company right who wants to acquire the shares who want to acquire the ownership and want to control the production usually invests in the direct investments foreign direct investments investors usually faces risks because they involve a lot of money and usually if a shareholder gets the profit automatically he also needs to face the risks you know the meaning of shares you know the meaning of shares if a company was established with 100 rupees now imagine this particular guy have given take 50 rupees out of it or say for example 40 rupees out of it now for every 100 rupees of the profit this particular company earns this particular company earns this guy is going to get 40 rupees isn't it because his share is 40 rupees 40 percentage in this particular investment at the same time if the company acquires 100 rupees losses this guy again need to bear 40 percentage of the losses this is the meaning of shares now imagine we have the same kind of 40 rupees worth of bond imagine this company has issued 40 rupees worth of bond now imagine this guy particular guy have subscribed to that means purchase it that and this guy will give 40 rupees to this particular company and irrespective of the shares and profits of this company this guy is going to get a periodic interest so this is the basic difference between a foreign direct mean this is the basic difference between a share and a bond we have clearly discussed it in the previous classes so automatically a shareholders particularly the shareholders and investors is going to face highest risks and you i just want to tell you one more important point here there is a committee called Aravind Mayaram committee Aravind Mayaram committee according to the Aravind Mayaram committee if our investments in a company exceeds 10 percentage in whatever way it is so automatically if the investments come to india through the foreign direct investment through the primary market we usually call it as a foreign direct investment if the investments come to india through the secondary market we call it as a foreign portfolio investment and Aravind Mariam said that if the investments in any particular company increases more than 10 percentage then it should be considered as foreign direct investment even if this comes through these FPIs we if the investments the total investments in the company increases more than 10 percentage then we should consider it as foreign direct investment I hope it see through this the imagine this is a company this company has a lot of shares being traded in the Bombay Stock Exchange imagine if somebody is see if somebody is investing if somebody is purchasing the only these shares of the company and his investments through the secondary market increased more than 10 percent imagine our this company is established with 100 rupees of the capital and he have purchased more than 10 percentage of this capital through the secondary market then it should be considered as a direct investment according to the Aravind Mayaram committee I hope it is very clear next see as I said this is the portfolio investment investor see all the investments into the country all the investments into the country right through the secondary market is called portfolio investments portfolio investment 
investors does not have direct control or management of the investments and mostly they just invest they just hold and they will sell it off and no control or shares in the assets or the property hence provides more liquidity so this is the basic difference between the foreign direct investments and portfolio investments when we look at the capital flowing outflow see now you can understand what is the meaning of this foreign portfolio investors have pulled out 42000 crores this month what is the meaning of it through the secondary market they invested about earlier they have invested about 42000 crores right now they are taking it back so this is the meaning of pulling out the money i hope you understood it now in india inflation surged to an 8 year high to 7.79% in the april prompting rbi to hike a repo rate of 90% basis point and you have discussed we have discussed this in the previous classes and when we look at these kind of things on the impact the foreign see impact on the market in rupee see india's foreign exchange reserves have fallen to 46 billion dollars in the last 9 months to 596 billion as of june 2022 mainly due to dollar appreciation of mda withdrawals right when the rupee depreciates automatically it may lead to higher import see automatically if one dollar is equal to 75 rupees right automatically what happens now if one dollar becomes rupee depreciates and if one dollar becomes 85 rupees automatically the import burden is going to get increased we need to pay more we need to have we need to exchange more and more rupees and we need to pay more in order to get the essential import as the strong dollar is good for the export oriented companies it is good for the exporting but bad for the import oriented industries such as oil gas and chemicals with the dip in the rupee oil imports and other import components will get costlier which will further lead to higher inflation this is another impact of this particular thing right this is the right this is about the foreign direct investment foreign portfolio investments and investors being pulling out and rupee getting depreciated so i hope you understood the concepts very clearly here so just try to note them down and if possible try to note them try to maintain a notebook and try to write all these things very clearly guys see now we are going to look at a question and we are just trying to we'll just try to solve it it's a previous year question which asked in 2020 with reference to the foreign direct investment in india which of the following is considered as its major characteristics so it is largely a non-debt capital flow see imagine this company this company needs to be established with 100 rupees now automatically see if this owner has 51 rupees with him he just need 49 rupees and if this 49 rupees is coming from the foreign country and it is the investment see the 100 rupees is nothing but capital so the capital flow is coming into the country but whether it is going to create any kind of a debt no it is not going to create any kind of a debt this 49 rupees is not the money that we have borrowed to create a debt but it is the investments investments does not create a borrow investments does not create a debt so it's la it is a largely non debt creating capital flow right this is the answer both next question the both foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio foreign institutional investors it's a part of portfolio investment are related to the investment in a country which one of the following statements best represents an important difference between the two see foreign institutional investors helps in increasing the capital availability in general while fdi only targets specific sectors this would be the best option see you need to understand what is the meaning of foreign institutional investments right foreign inst in foreign countries so you see i told you foreign institutional investment is a kind of portfolio investment because depository receipts foreign institutional investment and offshore funds all these are the three varieties of the port foreign portfolio investments what does it mean the depository receipts institutional investment and offer this offshore funds investments comes into india through the secondary market if the investment comes into india through the secondary market we call portfolio investment automatically all these three comes through the secondary market see take the example of usa in the usa you have a lot of institutions like mutual funds insurance companies all of these institutions invest into india through the secondary market automatically investment foreign investment into india through the secondary market is called portfolio investment and if these institutions invest in india through the secondary market we call it as foreign institutional investment so this is called foreign institutional investment and you also discussed we have discussed clearly about fds so this is about the two questions previously I hope you clearly acquired the knowledge with respect to all these things guys. Just try to note the things down. 
The next topic that we are going to discuss is India's emerging twin deficit problems. It is not twin balance sheet problems. Be careful. It is twin deficit problems. RBI in its monthly economic review reported report highlighted two key areas of concern for Indian economy. The first one is the fiscal deficit and the second one is the current account deficit. The first one is the fiscal deficit and second one is the current account deficit. So RBI in its report have suggested these are the two areas where the Indian economy is mostly concerned with. Now first we need to discuss about the fiscal deficit and current account deficit. Primarily we need to discuss the basic difference as we discuss the difference between foreign direct investment and portfolio investment. So the first one we need to discuss is the fiscal deficit. The second one we need to discuss is current account deficit. See, imagine, let's consider what is the meaning of a deficit, guys? Primarily, what is the meaning of a deficit? Deficit is nothing but, deficit means literally means we want something but we don't have it. Deficit means we want something but we don't have it. In the economic perspective, deficit means we need some money but we don't have it. This is the meaning of foreign, I mean, this is the meaning of deficits in the economy. When it comes to the foreign, I mean, it comes to the fiscal deficits, see, try to understand. Imagine if a government wants to make an expenditure of 100 rupees. But it only received an, a revenue of 97 rupees through its various taxes. You know, the central government can impose the direct taxes and state government can impose them. I mean, the state governments can only impose the indirect taxes. See, the central government imposes the direct taxes as well as indirect taxes. The state government imposes the indirect taxes mostly. The only direct tax that a state can impose is a state can impose is that income tax on the agriculture income. Income earned through the agriculture can be taxed by the state governments and such type of tax is called income tax and it comes under the direct tax. So this is the only direct tax that a state can impose but many of the states exempt this kind of income tax for the farmers and you know that and we have discussed it in the classes. So as a result if the government gets only 97 rupees of the revenue and it wants to make an expenditure of 100 so automatically it is deficient in 3 rupees the government want 3 rupees but you don't have it because it received only 97 but it wants to make an expenditure of 100 so deficit is 3 rupees now understand if the government borrows this 3 rupees from the market you know that in the economic classes we have discussed clearly about the internal borrowings and we also discussed about the external borrowings if government borrows through the within the country, we call it as internal borrowings. If the government borrows outside the country, it is called external borrowings. And I am not going to bore deep into the statics because we have discussed all these things very clearly in our static classes. So, this 3 rupees, if the government borrows this 3 rupees, the government borrows this 3 rupees and adds this 3 rupees to the revenue. And you know that the government's revenue, the government's revenue is of two types. One is the see revenue receipts and second one is the capital receipts. All the one-way receipts is the one one-way receipts are simple guys. If once received by the government, need not to be paid back. If once government receives something and it need not to be paid back, it's called one-way transaction. And if the government receives some money and if it need to be paid back directly, it is called capital transaction. It is not only true in case of government, even if it is in case in if it is true in case of you. Imagine if you receive a salary. And if you once receive a salary, you need not to pay back it directly to someone. It is called your revenue receipt. Imagine you get a loan from a bank and that is called capital receipt for you because at one point of time you need to pay it back. So the first salary is one way transaction, once received need not to be paid back and the second transaction, the loan once received need to be paid back. So transactions, two transactions. So all these two way transactions are capital like such as loans and all the one way transactions are called revenue transactions. So in such a way under the capital receipts, capital receipt means received, the borrowings are the major component. So automatically the government remain want to make an expenditure of 100 rupees but it only gets a revenue of 97 rupees and it borrows 3 rupees and adds 3 to it and also makes 100. So automatically therefore the budget deficit would be 0. Right? Now this 3 rupees is nothing but the fiscal deficit. To express it in a form like way expenditure government's budget expenditure minus budget revenue budget revenue the revenue is a borrowings is also a revenue it comes under the definition of the capital receipts right so if we explore if we exclude the borrowings if we exclude the borrowings and other liabilities if we exclude the borrowings and other liabilities of the government 
for a particular year right out of the total revenue we get the yeah, we get the fiscal deficit to put it simply to put it as very simply in a layman language fiscal deficit is nothing but the borrowed money by the government and at the financial year the borrowings and other liabilities of the government at the financial at the end of the financial year is nothing but the fiscal deficits i hope it is very clear for you next we need to discuss about the current account deficit as i said guys here you need to understand about two important terms what is a current transaction and what is a capital transaction you need to be very careful with respect to these two important terms now all one way transactions are called all one way transactions are called current transactions and all two way transactions are called capital transactions now let us try to understand the meaning of capital current account deficit see both current account deficit and capital account deficit are a part of balance of payment if you add the current account deficit plus capital account deficit right say for example if you add the current account balance plus capital account balance you will get the balance of payment deficit means they are in deficits see now try to understand what is the meaning of balance of payment similarly like the way in which the one way and two way transactions see all the transactions made by the government listen carefully guys all the transactions made by the government and private in a financial year with the outside world with the outside world are recorded in a systematic book and that book is nothing but balance of payment now these transactions see any transactions are of two types one way transaction or two way transaction say for example i will give you the example imagine india exports mangoes to the usa usa pays us the money imagine india exports 10 lakh rupees worth of mangoes to the usa and usa pays the 10 lakh rupees transaction ended there see trans whenever i talk about the transaction it is a transaction with respect to money a transaction should involve money so once we export mangoes to the usa usa pays us the money the transaction ends there we call them as one way transactions now imagine the second one if india imports the crude oil from the gulf countries india pays the money the pays the money transaction ends there these are called one way transactions right all such kind of a transactions made by the government as well as private are recorded as current account transactions now so automatically the imports the exports of both the goods and services comes under the current account transactions isn't it or not it see if we import something we pay the money transaction ended there one way transaction if we export something we receive the money right transaction ended there one way transactions so all one way transactions are current account transactions so it they are mentioned in the current account balance similarly imagine if a person invests in india imagine a foreigner investing in india through fdis or fpis so it's a one way transaction once a person invest money here automatically the profits need to be paid to him so it's a two way transaction once the money is received it is getting paid back to him right once imagine this is the first example imagine another example let's say for example if a foreign country is giving loan to us one way transaction yeah, and we are paying back the interest periodically and after a period of time we need to pay back the principal also so such kind of a transactions are two way so all such transactions made by the government and a private in a financial year comes under the capital account transactions i hope it is very clear now let us try to understand say for example if india exported india exported 100 rupees worth of goods to foreign countries and india have imported and india have imported 110 rupees worth of goods india exported 100 and india imported 1 rupees of the goods so all such kind of transactions with respect to imports and exports are recorded in the current account transactions so all these transactions say for example now this is the current account transactions and we calculate the balance here it is the current account balance is negative 10 negative 10 rupees or 10 dollars now in a similar way imagine if see all the two way transactions made are calculated in the capital account transactions imagine out of the country imagine out of the country from india the capital outflow or all these transactions accounted for 100 rupees and what is coming into india in a two way transaction is about 130 so we have the capital account balance as positive 30 so the current account balance is minus 10 the this capital account balance is positive 30 so if we add both these things minus 10 and plus 30 you will get a balance of right plus 20 now we call it as plus 20 is called balance of payments 
plus 20 it's called balance of payments imagine this is minus 10 here and imagine see what is going out of the country is 100 and imagine what it is coming into the country is just 90 so automatically the capital account balance is all again minus 10 so if we add both these things minus 10 and minus 10 what do you get automatically you get minus 20 then we say the balance of payments is a negative so this is a surplus balance of payment this is a negative balance of payment balance unfavorable balance of payment conditions you might have these kind of awards in the hindu newspapers and these articles so this is the meaning of this unfavorable balance of payment and this is the favorable balance of payments now try to understand guys rbi is the custodian of foreign reserves in the country rbi maintains foreign reserves in the form of foreign currencies gold sdrs and reserve portion of imf in four major forms now when a current account when this kind of a balance is goes into the balance of payment goes into the negative the say for example this is 20 dollars minus 20 dollars the foreign reserves held by the rbi is see out of them 20 dollars will be brought and it is made to the zero and if the this balance of payment is positive this 20 dollars is added to the foreign reserves in such a way if it is a negative the amount will be drawn and used for it and if it is positive the extra amount will be added to it added to the foreign reserves in such a way the things goes on i think you have clearly understood what is the difference between of the what is the meaning of fiscal deficits what is the meaning of fiscal deficit and you also clearly understood what is the meaning of current account deficit capital account deficit and you also understood this is nothing but the balance of payments so the basics are very clear now let us try to look at the current affair topic see now let us try to understand the current affairs see on fiscal deficit you know the meaning of fiscal the fiscal deficit may be high due to cuts in the excess duties on diesel and petrol you know excess duty is an indirect tax we told we have discussed that if impact of tax and incidence of taxes on multiple points we call it as indirect tax you know excess duty is a tax imposed on the production of goods and services in the previous classes those who guys are following the classes you have already understood the what is the meaning of excess duty excess duty is nothing but it is a tax imposed on the production of goods and services goods and services in the country imposed on the production of goods and services in the country right now fiscal deficit may be high due to these cuts it cuts in the excess duty automatically reduces the revenue and if the government reduces the revenue if the government revenue is reduced automatically instead of 97 rupees if my government gets 96 rupees automatically they need to borrow more 4 rupees so it is going to increase the fiscal deficits it is as simple as that when we look at the current account deficit see higher import bills may increase current account deficit say for example if we export 100 and if we import 110 so automatically if we import more if we export less the current account balance is minus 10 so higher import bills may account current account may increase current account deficit so costlier imports such as crude oil and other commodities will not only widen the current account deficit but also depreciates the rupee because in order to see we need foreign currencies in order to purchase this crude oil imagine the foreign currency as a commodity now if we need more and more foreign currency to purchase the crude oil and if we need foreign currency we are going to demand more foreign currency if demand if something is demanded more automatically it value increases so dollar to rupee value exchange increases so automatically indian rupee is depreciated so it not only widens the current account deficit it also depreciates the rupee in such a way i hope you understood the meaning of this statement a weaker rupee automatically a depreciated rupee will in turn make future imports costlier right isn't it or not see already we are just exporting 100 and just we are importing 110 now already that is current account balance is 10 minus 10 now if this crude oil price see imagine if we demand more and more crude oil and the rupee depreciate automatically earlier for if one if we are importing say for example we are importing 10 goods with 110 rupees now for the same 10 goods we need to pay now 130 rupees or 120 rupees because rupees is depreciated so automatically it widens that it is also not only going to depreciate the rupee it is also going to widen the current account deficit to sit again minus 30 right this is the meaning of it pulling out of the funds from the emerging markets rupee can also be weakened if in response to the higher interest rates in the western economy especially the us foreign portfolio investment continue to pull out the money as we discussed in the earlier classes earlier example from indian market which too will hurt the rupee in the further and increase the current account deficits 
Now, when we look at the impact of twin, uh, twin deficits in the economy, although no cause of worry is in the short term, the twin deficit may in long term reduce the savings, depreciate the rupee as we discussed and imbalances and imbalance the fiscal investments of the government and social purpose automatically if the government borrows more and money more and more money and if it goes for the revenue expenditure the essential money need to invest for the capital market capital investments which creates an assets and generate the revenue provides employment to the people such kind of a things are reduced right so this is about this impact of twin deficits this is the main concern raised by the rbi in its report so currently the fiscal deficit problems as well as this current account deficits is the main concern of the economy as for RBI. So whenever there is an article with respect to whenever there is a current affairs with respect to RBI, you should be very careful with it. So as I said, I already explained, explained to you and just you can go through the details of this current account deficit. Now the next current affair we need to discuss is about right. See the same are this same topic. Five states need to take steps to stabilize the debt level according to the RBI as per this report. So you see, its debt to GDP ratio, Punjab, its debt to GDP ratio is projected to exceed 45% in 2026 and 2027. See, debt to GSDP ratio, state gross domestic product. I told you the budget deficits, primary deficits, fiscal deficits, any deficit is expressed, can be expressed in monetary terms and they can also be expressed as percentage of GDP. Say for example, if GDP of a country is 100 rupees, then if the fiscal deficit is 3 rupees, then automatically the fiscal deficit is expressed as 3 percentage of the GSDP, uh, GDP. Similarly, say try to understand, if Indian economy is about 1.97 lakh crores, it is around 2.3 trillion. And you can also express the fiscal deficits as a percentage of that 1.97 lakh crores I told you before. Now, the Rajasthan, Kerala and West Bengal projected to exceed the debt to GDP ratio of 37%, 35% by 2026 and 2027. These states will need to undertake significant corrective steps to stabilize their debt levels. Once we discussed about the public finance chapter, Remember guys, in the static classes, we have discussed clearly about the public finance. In the public finance, we have discussed about the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Acts. These acts are mainly enacted to control, to have a physical discipline in the country. The governments cannot go for more and more further borrowings in order to fulfill their responsibilities like having the populist measure these days, fulfilling the populist measure these days. So they have to stabilize at any cost. right? 10 states accounting for half of the total expenditure in India are this Punjab, Kerala, West Bengal, Andhra Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh. And this is the data you need to remember. You can incorporate this kind of a data in your main answers. Right? Debt to GDP ratio. Like just it is a metric that shows the state was what it produced. It's simple. Produce means output. Output means GSDP. Right? Output means GSDP. Was means money nothing but debt. So automatically it's a metric that shows what state owes with what it produces. Don't get confused, produces means output, output is nothing but GSDP. Now when we look at the reasons for this deterioration of the fiscal positions of the states, see no, can, no state have tried to adhere to the targets given by the 15th Finance Commission. Among the 10 states, AP, Bihar, Rajasthan and Punjab exceeded both the deficits like both the debt as well as fiscal deficit targets for the year 2020 and 2021. Uh, guys, in the previous classes, we have discussed that for any particular state, for any particular state, what are the major sources of revenue for them? Like constitution have given various responsibilities for the state governments. What are those responsibilities? Public order, police, health, welfare measures, all these are the functions given for the state government by the constitution. In order to fulfill these responsibilities, the state government need revenue. This money comes from the taxes. But this, this state government is going to impose the indirect taxes like octroi, sales tax, VAT, all these things are once uh, once prevalent in the economy. Now all these indirect taxes were subsumed, were first converted into the state VAT and then state VAT is converted into the SGST and we have known about it. We have discussed about it very clearly. Now the state GST, state GST, SGST is one of the import, important component of state's own tax revenue. 
right this is that the imposition of indirect taxes is one of the major source of revenue for the state as far as the direct taxes is concerned the state is the state is not empowered by the constitution to impose the direct taxes but remember the state can impose a tax on the agricultural income so it automatically it becomes agricultural income tax so the state can impose a direct tax one and only one direct tax that is income tax on the agriculture but fortunately many of the states have exempted these kind of a taxes on agricultural income but it has the power and you need to remember if the states see these days this is the current affair this is the things going on as the states is losing its revenue after the implementation of the gst now the state the many of the economic experts in the country have suggesting the central government to enact a law by the parliament so that allowing the states or empowering the states to impose more and more direct taxes so that they can enhance their revenue right as the states you see try to understand guys once the state used to impose different kinds of indirect taxes like octroi luxury tax entry tax entertainment tax amusement tax in such a way they impose different kinds of indirect taxes so that their own tax revenue is very much high but once the gst implementation once the gst came into force effective from july 1st 2017 many of these state indirect taxes got subsumed into the gst but as the center promised that state is going to get more and more revenue but it didn't happen at the ground level at the ground level the gst tax collections is not as much as high when compared to the previous non tax regime non gst tax regime of the state governments now imagine it initially the central government came up with gst compensation fund but this gst compensation fund is not being given to the states so that's the reason economic experts all around the days these these days are suggesting to allow the states to have states to impose direct taxes but you need to remember as far as the prelims is concerned the only direct tax that a state can impose is income tax on the agriculture but fortunately many of the states have exempted it see now you hope you understood the meaning of this own taxes it is said the own tax revenues of some of these states like madhya pradesh punjab kerala has been declining over time making them fiscally more vulnerable see volatile on the non tax revenues all these are the reasons high revenue expenditure these days say for example around 80 to 88% is the 80 to 90% is the level of expenditure revenue expenditure made by the states out of the 100 rupees expenditure if you make an expenditure of 80 to 90 rupees as a revenue expenditure what are you going to get generated if the expenditure is 90% is revenue which is one way which does not generate any kind of which does not create any kind of asset because it's not a capital expenditure what the future generations is going to get automatically if states makes more and more money as a revenue expenditure and if they don't go for capital expenditure as a result there is no capital formation and if there is no capital formation automatically there is no revenue being generated in the future then what happens state in order to fulfill the responsibilities increases the taxes on the people again if the people does not realize these things in future they are going to pay for it right so in such a way the things goes on right these things are need to be so in such a way so in order to avoid these things itself fiscal responsibility and budget management acts being enacted so the shares of the revenue expenditure in the total expenditure of these states is just is about 80 to 90 percentage majorly 80 to 90 percentage or at least 60 percentage of this expenditure should be capital which creating the assets and generates the revenue but it's unfortunately revenue expenditure some states like rajasthan west bengal punjab kerala spend around 90 percentage of their amounts as a revenue expenditure it does not create any kind of an asset this results in poor expenditure quality as reflected in their high revenue spending to the capital outlays capital expenditure to way expenditure capital expenditure creates assets capital expenditure is going to generate revenue for the government in future with that extra generated revenue they can fulfill the responsibilities but if the revenue expenditure is done it is not going to increase the generation it is not going to generate the revenue in future and in the future if the government state government does not get the revenue they are going to impose the taxes they are going to increase the taxes on the people itself by then so it is going to be paid by our future generations this is the thing goes on it's not a new thing in the economy it already happened all around the world in many states so this is all about the important reasons right and see right high committed expenditure just try to remember the meaning of committed expenditure this include interest payments pensions and administrative expenses all the social welfare schemes and populist measures all these are the main things main reasons why 
state's fiscal position is getting deteriorated these days. These kind of topics are very much important both for your prelims perspective and mains perspective. So guys, data will be given to you, data will be available for you through various things, through various sources. But perspective with respect to the economy can only be understood through the classes. So that's why I'm emphasizing so that whenever I'm giving you these kind of a perspectives in the classes, just try to note them down, right? Next. Impacts of increased G to GDP ratio, you know that we in the static classes we have discussed what happens when the, then the debt to GDP ratio increases for states. If the, all states aggregate, it would create a suicidal cycle. If See, if the debt to GDP ratio increases, say for example, if the government is making an expenditure of 100 rupees and it is going in 97 rupees and see, all of a sudden if they go for Say the fiscal deficit is 3 rupees and all of a sudden if revenue decreases and if the government wants to go for more 4% rupees, 4 rupees borrowings automatically on the previous thing they need to pay the interest rate. So out of the new borrowings majority of the amount goes for the payment of the old debt and borrowings. So in such a way the fiscal deficit increases and there is no and most of the fiscal deficits are the borrowing amount which made by the government goes for the revenue expenditure and the states slowly gets moved into the vicious cycle and thereby you can see the result that 80 to 90% of the expenditure goes on for the revenue. The state should not be moved into these kind of vicious cycles. Right? So this is about the report recently published by the RBI. See, and the next topic, I think you have understood very clearly and that just try to develop the perspectives and if you pause the video, just go back to the video and just try to reason all these perspectives and just try to note it down. The next topic is the major revamp of the Banks Board Bureau. You know, these days, in the last year and even this year prelims, we have the question on the Bank's Board Bureau. See, what's the issue, guys? See, the Finance Ministry is working to expand and relaunch the Bank's Board Bureau by bringing in more representatives from the insurance sector. When we look at the background, recently the Delhi High Court last year have observed that the Bureau was not a competent body to recommend the appointments to the public sector undertakings, general insurance, and held that the circulars enabling the Bank's Board Bureau to select the general managers and directors of the PSUs were not legally valid, were not legally valid. You need to be very careful here, you need to remember this. So as the court said, it's the recommendations made by these things are not legally valid as far as the appointments of these two these PSUs is concerned, particularly because it's the mandate given to the Bank's Board Bureau. So, the government, the finance ministry is coming up with a relaunched, revamped Bank's Board Bureau. See, despite BBB's good work, recruitment to the higher level has been slow. It's the agency which is going to recommend the people for the higher positions. Also, the BBB extends two-year term under and the new recruits can restart only when a new body is in place and the government is trying to come up with it. Now, whenever we find out these kind of a boards, our bodies, it's very important to have the static topics for it. See, just basics. It was set up in the year, it was set up in the month February 2016 as an autonomous body based on the recommendations of the RBI appointed NIAC committee. These kind of a committees, name of the committees are very much important guys. And it was a part of the Indra Dhanush plan of the government. It will make recommendations to the appointments of the directors, to the public sector bankings and other state-owned financial institutions. This is the famous thing, you may have already observed it. The Ministry of Finance takes the final decision on the appointments in consultation with the Prime Minister's office, PMO. This should be the point you need to be remembered, right? This is about this Bank's Board Bureau and it's a topic which is in, right, which is going on currently in the news and it's the news in transition. And whenever the news appears further in the further newspapers and news articles, we are going to continue the discussion. So. So this is all about this week's economic current affairs guys. I hope you understood the money market, you have understood the, about the composition of the capital market, their instruments, tools, FDIs, FPIs and we have discussed about the different kinds of tax, taxes, tax structures and we also discussed about the report of the money, report of the RBI where it is going to discuss, where it clearly discussed about the fiscal positions of the states these days and we also discussed about the news in transaction with respect to Bank Sport Bureau. I hope you clearly understood and enjoyed all these current affairs. Guys, remember, just try to note the, all these things. Just pause the video, just listen once again and try to note all these things in your notebooks because you can get the facts, but you can't get the perspectives. Perspectives can be developed only in the classes. So, this will be very important for you. So, 
we will meet in the next class with again different kinds of economic current affairs which appears in this coming week so i hope you understood and enjoyed this class till then stay tuned to northwoods is thank you